Hi folks, Florida Man here. Today I bring you my paddle diplomacy commentary. The game was actually called PDL 2022 September 1 because it was the final round of the PDL 2022 tournament, but I recognize that when video titles sound similar to one another, as when several games in a league or a tournament are played, it can result in less traffic to a perfectly good diplomacy commentary, hence the goofy name change. Anyway, this game was played on the classic map, and I was assigned to play as Germany. I started out tentatively optimistic. We will see how those positive expectations were repaid. In spring 1901, I tried to establish friendly relations with both France and England, and get either or both of them to agree to go after the other. Unfortunately, they were both pretty non-committal in spring. I tried dangling the prospect of a sea lion with Russia to France, since it would mean a fairly easy disposal of England, but he just entered into a digression about when sea lions are good and when they're not, and really didn't say anything that sounded like he was taking a position either way or really talking about this specific situation. I began to think my neighbors might be allied against me. England was only interested in asking me to let him into Belgium, although he coupled that request with assurances of friendship. Since I didn't really believe I had any solid allies, despite my best attempts, I tried to push Russia into a northern opening. If Russia moved to potentially bounce England in Norway, that would almost guarantee England focused on Norway over Belgium. And if that happened, it would allow me to take Belgium for myself, or at least give me complete control over who got it. But Russia was non-committal too. I tried to hint that it would improve his chances of getting into Sweden, but I don't think I managed to be very persuasive. I think I'm usually better at framing a persuasive argument when I'm in a confident frame of mind. Here I felt I was flying blind, so I didn't have any confidence to project to Russia. Italy and I didn't talk as much, nothing useful coming from that corner for the moment, so the orders processed without me having a decent plan of attack, unfortunately. When moves processed, you see I made probably my most typical German opening, going for Ruhr, Denmark, and Kiel. This leaves me with influence over Belgium and Sweden, which will hopefully be useful bargaining chips here. England makes the single best opening for England, in my opinion, the Jorvik opening, which we've discussed on this channel before. This allows him to potentially convoy to Norway or Belgium, and it gives him the opportunity to capture both. There's a reason I endorsed this opening in the video I made on it. France made a conservative opening, but a good one. He self-bounced in Burgundy while moving his fleet to Mid-Atlantic Ocean, an opening that offends no one while securing every corner of France and allowing you to capture Iberia in fall. The only flaw in this opening is that it leaves France without any say over who gets Belgium. But that can be a benefit in the hands of a politically savvy French player, since it prevents you from offending either Germany or England. That's my theory, anyway. Strong openings from a strong pair of players. It would be nice if there was a weak link on my side of the map. Meanwhile, in the east, Austria opened to Adriatic Sea, Serbia, and Trieste, the last of which bounced because Italy tried to enter Trieste in spring 1901. At the same time, Russia opened to Galicia, and Turkey opened with the Balkan concentration. In short, it looks like Austria is the obvious weak link in the east, with all of his neighbors joining in a group attack on him. Really, the only two things that could save him are Turkey coming to his rescue, or serious mistakes on the part of his attackers that keep him relevant long enough to change someone's mind. This means the East will probably settle itself quickly, which is very negative for those of us in the West, especially England and myself. In fall 1901, my negotiations were even more unnerving than in spring. France felt the need to offer an unsolicited explanation for his self-bounce in Burgundy. It was a DMZ area but it was as if he was a guilty party who ought to give some excuse as to why he had done that in the spring, which was not encouraging as an indicator of his state of mind. He claimed that England was friendly toward him, and he wasn't sure if England was going after me or Russia, but the implication was clearly that I should factor that in when deciding whether to let England into Belgium or not. A very aggravating negotiations phase. England made it clear that he was offering an exchange of alliance for Belgium. But unfortunately, I've often found that people who make such statements are immediately untrue once given what they want. France remained verbally completely non-committal though, so it was a choice between a promise of alliance that might be broken and no promises or assurances at all from the French player, who was clearly trying to push me and England toward each other and leave himself free to choose a side. So I decided to go after France. 
You see, I move into Burgundy and Holland, securing my two builds and holding in Denmark so I can retain a friendly relationship with Russia. I can't have three people attacking me in 1902 after all. Now the question was what England would do in response to my display of commitment. England and France's fall moves were just taking advantage of opportunities to get builds with no opposition. Russia easily took Budapest as well as Sweden and Romania, while Italy secured Austria's blessing to convoy into Greece. Austria made a bad guess about which centers to defend from attack, hence the loss of Budapest, and with that, it looked like the fight in the west was getting started, while the fight in the east was all over but the crying. In the aftermath of the fall moves, I tried to shore up my position by ingratiating myself with England, who achieved two gains thanks purely to my friendly disposition toward him. I assured him I would be a steady ally against France, that I was building armies, and that I hoped he would build in Liverpool. He said he had no problem in principle with that, but there was the matter of the Russian threat. Ultimately, though, he seemed to agree with me that we should focus on France for now, and not provoke Russia. France seemed quite ticked off at me for some reason. It was a bit frustrating to hear from someone who was sitting on the fence this whole time that it was inconvenient that I had committed forces against him. This is what always happens when you play diplomacy. People have to choose sides. The sooner you can form a committed arrangement with someone, the better your chances. This seemed to be the best way for me to either head off an arrangement against me, or to pull England into an alliance against France. No brainer. I had been thinking about trying to get Russia to build a St. Pete North Coast fleet, because I really would have taken the chance to switch sides if it had presented itself, since I didn't trust England any more than I trusted France. Unfortunately, though, France's attitude forced me to agree with Russia that he should probably not build a North Coast fleet, so he instead builds on the armies. With the build phase processing, I acquired armies as I had promised England. There was no upside to doing anything else, and England similarly made fleet builds in Liverpool and London, which was a pretty good pair of builds for going after France. France surprisingly did what he'd told me he was doing before he sent his messages expressing hostility to me. He constructed a fleet and an army. It felt like a strange choice if he believed England might side with him, almost intended to push England into my arms. Russia built all armies, just like me, which I found a little bit intimidating, but Russia didn't really have much else to do with those builds, and I felt I would have been a bit better off if he'd made the St. Pete North Coast build, but I also thought I could watch my back well enough for now that he wouldn't try to stick the knife in. Italy built a fleet, seemingly indicating his hostility toward either France or the Juggernaut, I should note that I was hoping Italy would intervene, and I actively worked to persuade him, since he seemed potentially more open-minded than most of the other relevant players. He felt too uncertain about what Austria and Turkey would do to try and help me, though, which I could understand. The word I had from everyone is that Austria was very uncommunicative. I never had a message from him myself, which partially explained why two out of three of his neighbors were attacking him. When a power is being attacked and relying on you to defend them, it's a little unnerving if they don't respond to your messages. It makes it totally unpredictable what they might do. All of which is to say that when Italy claimed he thought Austria might potentially strike at Venice, I actually found that credible. Which is pretty unusual for me, <laughs> when it comes to Italy and Austria. With Spring, you see England and I are working together. He supports me into Picardy using his Belgium unit, while France and I fight over Burgundy inconclusively. Unfortunately, England is not quite moving as I would have expected from someone who's really committed against France. He moves Liverpool to Wales instead of Irish Sea, which is a bizarre and counterproductive choice. Verbally, England was indicating a disproportionate concern about Russia, which again felt bizarre, considering we were in an all-out battle with Fortress France as far as I was concerned, and Russia was doing nothing to England. At this point, I began trying to rekindle the relationship with France, but he expressed he wasn't interested, which wasn't really all that surprising given his attitude earlier. To the south, the juggernaut continued to progress against Austria, now with Italian support. Italy messaged me after moves processed to ask if I thought there was a juggernaut going on, and since Italy was the only person besides Russia who was being somewhat helpful to me, I tried to give him as helpful information as I could. I told him, Russia has given me no hint as to whether he favors you or Turkey, the only thing that's clear is that he disfavors Austria, and he credits someone who he did not name with giving him intel that allowed him to sucker punch Austria before. I would not be surprised if he feels some debt to that person. I don't know if that's you or Turkey, but that's the closest I have to a hint in this respect. 
With the fall, we see it seemingly becomes conclusive that there is no juggernaut, as Italy's attack on Turkey in Bulgaria is complemented by Russia's attack on Turkey in Serbia and a Russian move into the Black Sea, reducing Austria and Turkey to a combined five centers. The Winter Green Alliance looks remarkably powerful here, and not for the last time, I feel the East is basically settled. The only question is how long it will take the two of them to head west. To the west, England stabs me, and even though I had my suspicions, there was really very little I could do here. At the same time, France destroys the unit I had on French soil, which was kind of a sticking point for him in our discussions before. I put out feelers to France yet again about maybe switching sides, maybe we work together now, but again, he wasn't really interested. With England having switched sides, my efforts were now spent on getting Russia and Italy to join me and attack my opponents. In the build phase, I worked Russia, and he basically said yes, I could help you and take Norway for myself, but what's the long-term play here? You know, I think there's a strain of thought in some of the more experienced players, especially in these league or tournament games, to play conservatively for a specific sort of ideal type of endgame. They're not looking for a solo. They're not even really trying to whittle down the draw. They're really just trying to limit their downside. And so there's a strange situation for me where I have to persuade Russia, who has no threats in the East anymore besides the possibility that Italy will make the mistake of turning on him, to become involved in the West. I would understand it better if Russia was more tempted by the idea of attacking me than the idea of helping me. The reluctance to become involved at all is kind of bizarre from my point of view. It's not a soloing sort of mindset, so I don't quite get it, because that's not how I play. I try to solo. You need fingers in every pie if you want to win, rather than just board topping. Maybe if I thought more like Russia here, though, I might do better in tournaments. The build phase sees Russia not quite persuaded by me yet, so he gets an army in St. Petersburg again, rather than the fleet that would actually be really useful to our joint effort. Italy now has two builds, and he's clearly capable of becoming involved in the West as well if he chooses to, while Austria destroys his unit in Albania in order to focus entirely on a bid for revenge against Italy. So with spring 1903 negotiations, I tried to bring in Italy to fight France with me, but he was rather conservative in outlook as well. At least it was sort of understandable in his case. With Austria focusing the last of his life force on him, he felt he was not yet secure against a possibility that Austria and Turkey would throw to Russia in order to sabotage him. So very little progress diplomatically this season. When spring orders process, I entered a move of Denmark to North Sea to show Russia that in the event he did choose to attack Norway, I was as good as my word. I was absolutely going to cut that support. The only progress in the West was that France took Burgundy, which is not a center, so I was okay for the moment. Germany can be a decent defensive power, I think, but mainly when it's facing conservative players like these ones. You'll note that there's a large amount of support orders entered. Norway supports North Sea to hold, which defends North Sea against absolutely nothing. North Sea supports Norway to hold, which I cut. North Sea holds in place instead of pressing the English advantage by moving into Helgoland Bight. Mid-Atlantic Ocean completely unnecessarily supports Brest to hold. Belgium supports Holland to hold, which is one of the only semi-useful moves out of these that I've just mentioned. There's a broad pattern to what I'm talking about here, which is that most of the orders England in particular makes are supports to hold. Part of that is that England and France are suspicious of each other, not just me. But a big part of that is also, in my opinion, that the order of supporting a unit to hold when it becomes a broad pattern like this is the red flag for player complacency. When players succumb to complacency, I kinda hate it. It stinks. It's only good if I'm the person they're supposed to be attacking, Complacency, though, is never the energy you want to demonstrate in diplomacy. This is an aggressive game, not a game where a large number of your units should be supporting to hold. The only time to make this sort of complacent moves is when you're in a dominant position and you're trying to lull another power or powers into a false sense of security by pretending you're resting on your laurels. England is making complacent moves, but it's not in a dominant position at all. It doesn't have a really stable or secure hold over any centers, except its home centers. In order to become secure, England needs to carve out some German territory to have a buffer zone. Entering all those support orders is just a way for England to give himself a false sense of security. The key mistake here is that this is giving me time to recover as Germany. Time that England did not have to give up. Not a lot interesting happening elsewhere. Austria unsuccessfully attacking Italy, Russia just lazily moving one unit to finish off Austria, 
He could have walked into both Trieste and Vienna this season if he'd tried, and walking into Vienna at least would have made a lot of sense. Instead, Galicia holds in place. Russia also ordered a convoy of Sevastopol to Ankara that was unlikely to succeed, instead of the more practical move of Sevastopol to Armenia. It doesn't endanger the Russian-Italian coalition's win over Turkey or Austria, it's just odd. It's like Russia is slow walking the victory in the east. It justifies to me Italy's suspicion of Russia here. In fall, however, we see some progress. Italy walks into Trieste with Russian support, and Russia takes Vienna. Although the Turk remains intact, with Russia only just now arriving in Armenia with his Sevastopol unit. Also, my persuasive efforts finally bear a little fruit. Russia takes the easy win by walking to Norway. Since I prevent any advancement by England or France elsewhere, they're still playing in that same boring, overly cautious, complacent way I mentioned before, which is the death of all progress. This effectively amounts to an unalloyed win for me. I also used my moves to try to make diplomatic progress, letting Italy know I was doing this to try and help him out. I used Munich to tap Tirolia here to make Italy more secure in his move finishing Austria off. It was completely unnecessary, and by cutting that support, I'm theoretically risking Munich. But in practice, Austria has no real history of cooperating with anyone, no grudge against me, no friendship with France, so I thought it was very little practical risk. In the build phase, I finally get that St. Pete North Coast fleet out of Russia, and he puts his other army in Sevastopol instead of Warsaw, which keeps me feeling very secure where I am. Italy builds another fleet, but he puts it in Venice of all places, as if the biggest influence on his build choice is the desire to not upset France. Going into spring 1904, I'm pulling hard to get Italy involved in the fight with France and England, but he is hard to move, man. Despite my efforts on his behalf, now that he's defeated the Austrian, he's back to obsessing over the possibility that Russia will make a solo bid. I'm really just not seeing it, and I tell him so. Russia can't get beyond the low teens. He's more likely to shrink from here than anything else, because France and England will eventually pull their heads out of whatever regions they've stuffed them into, and they'll actually start to coordinate. They outnumber me and Russia in the north, so they should be able to take all of Scandinavia unless something happens that's unexpected. The only realistic possibility that could save us is an Italian entry. Italy only wants to do it if he and Russia are able to negotiate some way they leave each other alone in the Balkans, and it seems as if neither of them can come to terms satisfactory to the other. The situation is becoming more difficult for me, as Italy's comfortable with a four-power draw that excludes me, much more so than with the possibility of risking the theoretical Russian solo in order to definitely expand into France. I can't say I'm sympathetic. It's been a pretty low-quality game from my perspective, not primarily because I've been on the defensive this whole time, since I do feel like I'm winning my defensive war, but because although I'm the main person on the defensive so far, I feel as if I'm the only person who's playing with guts at all. Italy, Russia, and England, as well as France, have all been pretty gutless. I'm trying to negotiate with Russia and Italy so I can perhaps help them with figuring out their Balkan border situation but it doesn't seem to be materializing. They're not really interested in using a mediator. When spring orders process, we see a lot of chaos happening. Russia is repositioning in Scandinavia and failed to tell me in time what he was actually doing, leading me to support a move that didn't actually happen, and England takes Denmark from me. Over further west, it's weirder. France moves into North Atlantic Ocean, and England vacates the channel in favor of Irish Sea. France also vacated Burgundy, moving to Gascony as if he's preparing for a convoy onto the English island. The Anglo-French alliance seems to be weakening, for reasons that I still can't really pinpoint. Since France was so anti-German before, though, I don't bother talking to him again just yet. I continue working on Russia and Italy, and one fall 1904 orders process, I score another diplomatic and tactical victory, because Russia not only supports me in regaining Denmark, but also helps me capture the North Sea. This is sort of a high point in the game, because the enemy alliance is actively losing ground, and they seem to have lost a lot of their trust. England moved into Liverpool, indicating he thought France was likely to steal it from him. France moved as though his alliance with England was still perfectly intact, though. After fall 1904 retreats, I try talking to France again. It seems like a good moment to try and turn him on England and form a new alliance. But at this point, France indicates that my invasion of Burgundy in 1901 caused him to develop some trust issues. I was surprised that that was any issue, since three full years had passed since it happened, and the so-called invasion didn't really involve any breach of a real relationship, nor any harm to France. 
He and I were just talking before that. We were not two committed allies, which was why I attacked him. I tried to persuade France that he shouldn't hold a grudge, and he shifted to arguing that England was more loyal than me, although he admitted England had had no real option in that, and that my working with Russia was a big problem, and that he had to stick with England as long as I was helping the board leader. He really didn't make much sense. If France attacked England now, he'd have the major head start, absorb England, and be able to work with me against Russia, who I could also see was a large, significant power who needed to be counterbalanced. And of course, I wasn't going to turn on Russia right now, when he was the only one keeping me alive against a primarily French attack. France was asking me to just blindly obey him, essentially, and I don't think he could have possibly thought he made sense. He was really just talking about why he had to keep fighting me in Russia is what it boils down to. When your arguments are post hoc justifications for things you already wanted to do, they end up reading as very irrational to the people who aren't in the same headspace. In the build phase, England gets a new fleet, Italy gets a useless army and a fleet that can actually be of help against France, and Turkey destroys his second to last unit. He holds on in Constantinople only now. In spring 1905, I continued to have hope that some solution to my French and English problems would present itself. That solution needed to be Italy to be a real solution, and in spring he moves into Turanian Sea at last. A whole lot of nothing happens elsewhere. Unfortunately in fall, Russia stabs me and takes Denmark, while at the same time England recaptures the North Sea, thus ending the high water mark of my survivability. France, Italy, and Russia also move up units surrounding Munich, which feels like a bit of an absurd maneuver. I'm so dangerous now that all of the other powers need to surround me to kill me off. I tried to make a final argument to England that maybe we should work together to avoid being pushed out of the draw that France, Italy, and Russia would surely agree to together, but my heart wasn't really in it anymore, and England did not agree. Russia sent an apologetic message to say that if he hadn't turned on me, Italy was going to help France attack both of us, probably BS, and that Italy was never going to turn and attack France, very possibly true, for reasons he did not or could not describe. A strange decision-making process by the two dominant powers on the map, I think, Italy and Russia, but not something I was capable of resisting militarily. Italy was, according to himself, very concerned about his security in the Balkans to the very end, while Russia made the same claims about Italy that I've just mentioned. It feels to me as if they were both a little too mistrustful, because if they'd been willing to work together on the crucial Western Front, or heck, if Italy had been willing to open up a Western Front at all, it should have been an easy win. France had conveyed to me that he would have thrown his centers to Italy if the game started to go against him as well, and I conveyed that to Italy. But the possible solo didn't seem to tantalize him. According to Italy, the thing that finally made up his mind was France agreeing to an England-Italy-Russia draw. And ultimately, that's the draw that happens, after the retreats and builds are processed. France and I both agree to be excluded from this draw. I did this because I was surrounded, my death seemed inevitable now, after I had repeatedly cheated it, and so there seemed to be no point in just continuing the game so that I could be quickly chopped up. I can't for the life of me figure out why France did this. According to England, he didn't communicate very much in this game, so I don't know how he so endeared himself to France. I can't help but think, after everything, that the French player had a bit of a screw loose. There is a lack of flexibility, a lack of a clear goal here, that seems incompatible with high-level diplomacy play. A very frustrating game, but for all that, an interesting game, with dramatic turns, full of sharp successes and failures, and one that ended in a way I never could have predicted until just before it happened. England being included, and France being out, was a truly insane result to the game. It reminds me of Twelve Angry Men. When you get enough people with diplomacy player personalities together, things can spiral out of control. I hope you enjoyed this diplomacy game, because someone had to. And I hope you'll like this video, subscribe, and comment with your craziest diplomacy thoughts. Just the craziest takes on the game of diplomacy that will melt my face when I read them should be fun. Please also give a warm hand to our most committed supporters, the patrons and translators who are now credited on screen. My Patreon link is in the description, and patrons get access to exclusive diplomacy content, as well as early access to my videos, so it's not a bad value for a dollar per month. Till next time. Florida Man, out.